Good day, this is uh, Dr. Peter Quinas. I am with the Miriam Gulli Hemophilia Center. It's been my uh, honor to uh, direct the center for the last uh, two decades or so, and to interact with many wonderful patients, a few who uh, have factor 10 deficiency, which is going to be the subject of today's uh, presentation. And uh, unfortunately, I'm unable to be available for the live uh, question and answer sessions in two weeks, as we have prior plans to be at a very nice uh, place in the Adirondacks in the New York mountains with no good Wi-Fi access. So uh, I'm happy uh, to share my email if you do have questions and you want to contact me uh, regarding this presentation or specific questions. Perhaps you have factor 10 deficiency and had some questions about your own situation that um, uh, was not answered uh, by my slides. So. In the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, give an overview of factor 10, really in the context of someone who is born with factor 10, because obviously it's a congenital disorder, and uh, what can happen over time in terms of uh, bleeding uh, symptoms and issues, and how best to manage them from childhood, whether it's a uh, baby uh, a, a male who needs a circumcision, or an adult who needs a major surgery. So as a starting point, uh, we're always obligated to share disclosures. And I have some very important disclosures. Uh, the first one is everybody assumes I own a restaurant, being Greek. At one point in America, one out of five um, restaurants were owned by Greeks. So my grandfather uh, did emigrate and uh, started a restaurant. So there is some uh, connection there. Uh, for better or for worse, uh, being close to the, largest, the nearest NFL uh, franchise, I'm a Bills fan. Uh, but above all, I uh, love to ride my bike. Uh, usually uh, when the weather is good between April and October in Rochester, I ride to work every day. And above all, I enjoy uh, hemophilia camp and I've had a wonderful time with uh, uh, many of uh, the participants uh, there over the years. But uh, all kidding aside, I really don't have any relevant conflicts of interest. I don't receive any funding from any of the uh, companies that may be involved in uh, bleeding disorders, particularly with uh, factor 10. And then another disclosure, as I mentioned, being Greek, I just want to uh, share some pictures of Greece as I go along here, uh, partly because I'm very proud that uh, two thirds of the medical words come from the Greek. And when the residents and uh, fellows and uh, nurses work with me, they know I'm fond of uh, asking a question first. So the first question I'm gonna ask you is, what in the world does factor 10 have to do with bleeding? So the answer to this is kind of a tongue in cheek slide here. I love to show this slide to the medical students because I get to find out how many of them are really nerdy and also very anxious that they're going to fail their exam because they think as if they have to memorize this crazy diagram here. And what I try to tell them is, number one, please relax. Number two, the reason why we're doing this, uh, this teaching session is so that I can share my wisdom to simplify things. So basically, to simplify uh, why somebody bleeds with factor 10 deficiency, you just have to remember that there's two steps in involved in forming a clot. And basically, if you have a deficiency in any of the key players in either step, then you could bleed. So for example, if you have a deficiency, if you're born with not making enough von Willebrand factor, that's gonna to lead to bleeding, von Willebrand disease. But remember to make a clot, as I am implying here, it really requires two steps. And that first step is bringing together these platelets that's gonna plug up, so to speak, the opening where the blood is coming out. And then the second step is putting a bag around those platelets. Platelets are kind of like marbles. If you put a bunch of marbles in your hand, you really uh, you know, can't get them to clump. So you need something to stick the marbles together. That's von Willebrand's factor. But even that's not enough. You need to put a bag around those marbles. You tell a kid to pick up your marbles, they're gonna look for a bag. And that bag is step two. And in step two, you need a whole series of clotting factors from Roman numeral number one, all the way to Roman numeral number 13. But this also includes factor 10. So if you have factor 10 deficiency, you were born with a genetic change in the instructions to produce it where you don't produce enough factor 10. And that's gonna to lead to a poor bag around those platelets, 
And if that bag is leaky, if it has holes, the blood's gonna escape through it. So I can use this diagram as a teaching point that normally we don't lead because in general, the blood minds its own business. Wave to the cells that are passing in the screen there. There's some red cells and white cells. But then all of a sudden, life happens. All of us can bleed when there's injury. And it's a reminder that we don't bleed in a vacuum. There has to be some type of trauma, whether we hit ourselves on the edge of a coffee table or cut ourselves when shaving, something has to make an opening, whether it's a surgeon uh, yanking the tooth out or whether it's monthly menses, the blood there is gonna escape. So we need to plug up that opening there. And to plug it up, we need to stop those red cells from moving. So the way we do that is that we uh, have these uh, uh, cells, uh, we have uh, this uh, uh, matrix uh, that is there called collagen. Part of that brown stuff there, part of this brown area here is collagen. And collagen becomes exposed. And then in the blood, von Willebrand's factor, this pink protein is traveling through in the blood and that binds to the collagen. So this purple protein, von Willebrand's, binds to the collagen here. And then it's kind of waving in the wind there where, where the blood is escaping and it starts picking off the platelets. Ah, there's some platelets. So the platelets then interact and they become activated. See how that small platelet gets activated? And then you get more platelets get activated. And then before you know it, you end up with this nice clump of platelets. So now that's the first step, making that plug of platelets. But remember, those platelets are kind of like marbles. They're not very, uh, that's not enough. They, the blood can still escape through there. So we need to put a bag around those platelets. And that's the help of the clotting factors that generate thrombin, and that includes factor 10. And then that's gonna put a bag around those uh, platelets. And then you finally kind of put, you finally stop the bleeding at that point. And again, technically, the question comes up, how does specifically factor 10 lead to this clot? And um, basically, factor 10 uh, helps generate uh, more of this thrombin. This is that enzyme I showed over here, the thrombin, right here, this enzyme. So factor 10 is a key enzyme here that uh, then is going to um, uh, lead uh, to the uh, fibrin uh, there. And, and there's in the next uh, slide, uh, it shows you again what happens if you cut yourself, the blood is gonna escape here in the left side here, and uh, you're gonna bleed. But we need to break, we need to plug this opening, this break in the dam here, so to speak. The way we do that is the help of platelets and this string here, this fibrin. So now you can see the blood, the bleeding has stopped because this yellow fibrin is stopping the bleeding. So to keep it simple, the reason why somebody bleeds is um, the reason why somebody bleeds is uh, basically due to really five possibilities. Either they're not born with enough platelets, they have either not enough platelets or a small number, or they bleed because they don't have enough von Willebrand's factor, this green protein, or they could bleed in the case of factor 10 deficiency, they can make the fibrin clot or they could bleed because their body is uh, breaking down the clot, what we call fibrinolysis. So those are basically the five types of bleeding one could have, bleeding from low platelets or platelet dysfunction or low von Willebrand's or making not enough of the clotting factor. That's what's happening in factor 10 deficiency. They're unable to make this fibrin clot. That clot is called a coagulum. So having a, a disorder of making the fibrin clot, the coagulum is called the coagulopathy. So factor 10 deficiency is a type of uh, coagulopathy in that, uh, in that regard. So just something uh, to, uh, to keep in mind in, in that uh, sense. And then if we think about it, the context of where you could bleed, you could bleed either because you can't make a good platelet plug, and these are some other conditions that are the subject of uh, the bleeding conference, but those are separate lectures. Or you could bleed because you don't have enough of any of these clotting factors. And obviously the main clotting factor of our attention today is factor 10 deficiency. I always find it helpful as I get more gray hairs uh, to uh, understand the historical context, background, and to be humble that we didn't know much about factor 10 
until uh, the past uh, century. And uh, it was uh, thanks to two groups of researchers in England in 1956, uh, uh, Dr. McFarlane and his colleagues uh, described uh, a young lady, Audrey Power, Power on the left, who had a very, uh, who had a bleeding, who had many bleeding problems. And they discovered a deficiency in this clotting factor. They actually named in part after her, the Power factor. And at the same time, another group in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, uh, also uh, came across the same uh, finding of a low clotting factor that they named after this patient, uh, Rufus Stork. And in honor of both patients, they named it the Stork Power Factor. So that is factor 10 deficiency. And behind uh, Rufus are some uh, very famous uh, researchers in this field. And uh, they show that um, Rufus had a very low level, 0%, while the normal level is 50 to 125%. While Audrey, unfortunately, being young and having menstrual periods, uh, was diagnosed at an early age at age 22. So how common is it for someone to have this deficiency that they discovered uh, over 50 years ago, uh, 60 years ago in Rufus and uh, Audrey? Well, it's uh, pretty common. It occurs in about uh, one to a million uh, individuals. So I'm sorry, it's not very common. What am I saying? It's pretty uncommon. And uh, Mr. Storr's case uh, is a good example. If we think about the genetic uh, basis of this, Mr. Storr obviously had a father and mother, and both of them were carriers. A carrier is usually a silent condition. They carry the genetic condition, but they don't have, uh, they don't have a low level. But once they have children, there is a chance in the case of, uh, of uh, one of the childs having uh, of, uh, of, you know, of having an abnormal, of, of carrying the, of, of having the gene from both the mother and the father. So that's what we call autosomal recessive. So that means Rufus was likely to have a very low factor 10 level because he received one abnormal gene from his uh, mom and one from his, uh, one from his, um, uh, one from his uh, dad. So he received, there's a 50% chance the dad was going to give him one abnormal factor 10 gene and 50% chance from the mother. And when that happened, that led to Rufus. And then once he had children, uh, all his children had a chance of being carriers. But that's it. 50% uh, chance of being carriers. His children themselves wouldn't have severe factor 10 deficiency like him because Rufus married someone who had normal factor 10. She wasn't a carrier. So this is unlike hemophilia, which is just related to the male in that regard. So females with factor 10 can also have um, a deficiency um, uh, in be, in, in develop bleeding symptoms. They have to get it from both mother and father. In other words, if a female, like uh, a male, uh, has factor 10 deficiency, that means both their parents were carriers. Then the next question is, once they uh, have this genetic uh, change, this genetic alteration, what type of uh, bleeding symptoms uh, could they have uh, you know, in that regard? So uh, that kind of takes us to the various types of bleeding uh, symptoms. And as you can see here, um, there's a number of uh, different bleeding really from head to toe. And a lot of that is predicated on injury to either the nose if a brother whacks uh, Rufus with a baseball bat, then they're going to have bleeding in their, you know, ear, nose, or throat in that sense. Or if Rufus fell off his bike, he could hit his head and bleed into the brain. Or if he has surgery without precautions taken to prevent bleeding, he could uh, bleed. Or if uh, he, you know, bumps into a coffee table, he could have bleeding into the thigh there. Or if he's doing a lot of running and twisting his knees, on uh, ice, let's say, um, he could have a bleed into his uh, joint. And in factor 10 deficiency, this is kind of a breakdown of the various symptoms that uh, will develop. Hematomas is a large bruise. It's a large collection of blood under the skin. And then easy bruising is obviously noticing, you know, bruises. And then nosebleed is self-explanatory. And then at childbirth, they could bleed at the time of circumcision or when the umbilical cord comes off. And then bleeding into the brain, thankfully, isn't very common, but it still happens in about one in seven patients with factor 10 deficiency. 
And uh, this type of severe bleeding is predicated in part on how severe is your deficiency. So ask your doctor if you don't know, what is your specific factor 10 level? How low is the level? If it's less than 1%, as in the case of rupus, it's very severe, my friends. And that's going to lead to major bleeding, bleeding into the brain if they hit their head, slipping on ice, or falling off their bike without wearing a helmet. Uh, or internal bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding. Whereas if it's 1% to 5%, there may be less severe of this bleeding, but they can have uh, brain bleeding. Rarely are they going to bleed into their brain if the level is in this range, 6 to 20%. Another way to understand the bleeding symptoms depends on uh, one's uh, a stage of life. So if you're in childhood, this is the type of bleeding you'd expect to see. Kids very commonly, you know, may be picking at their nose. They may be more likely to get nosebleed. We see net less nose bleeding as they get older. And then if it's a female with factor 10 deficiency, then we start seeing heavy periods where they're changing every two hours. We can also see gut bleeding uh, when they're flossing uh, or when they're having a dental cleaning or when their wisdom tooth is removed. Remember, that's a rite of passage. Uh, about 75% of patients need their wisdom teeth removed, usually conveniently uh, in their high school year when it's the summer or before they start uh, their freshman year of college. And um, so consequently, they could have oozing in that uh, situation. And then as they get older, in the case of women, there's a risk of uh, bleeding after childbirth, as well as bleeding uh, with surgeries, if precautions are not taken. Just some quick information about uh, bruising. Uh, this is uh, relatively common. Um, and some details about the bruising is that often if you have, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the bruising, it occurs one to four times a month and uh, often the size of a quarter or larger. As far as nose bleeding, the nose bleeding can uh, often last more than 10 minutes. It can occur at least five times a year, sometimes uh, once a week, particularly during the dry winter months. It's that dryness when we don't have the humidifiers working on the furnace or in the room can dry up. And certainly if you're on other, me other medications like aspirin, that could cause uh, bleeding as well as high blood pressure. Um, and then, uh, again, it's important when you get a nosebleed, please tell your provider whether it's uh, always one nostril or not, because you may coincidentally have a little bleeding point, a little cluster of blood vessels from which you can bleed from. So that's something uh, to keep in mind, uh, you know, in that, uh, in that regard. And then when you're uh, flossing uh, your teeth, you could bleed. Uh, and that could be worse. If uh, you don't floss because you bleed, you can develop gingivitis, and that can make the bleeding worse. And then obviously, when they remove the wisdom tooth, if precautions aren't taken, you could bleed and ooze for over three hours, and you may have to go back to see your um, uh, oral surgeon to have it packed. Often before they do that, they'll remind you to try a tea bag because tea bags have tannins within them, and that can help promote clotting. That's something to keep in mind. If you're a female, the periods could be the bane of one's existence, Sally, where you're changing under uh, 30 minutes, certainly under two hours, and also uh, going through uh, one and uh, uh, two tampons and pad at a time or superabsorbent brand. And the patient may know it's class the size of a quarter. For a research study we did, we had a patient collect all their tampons and pads, and this is how many tampons and pads this patient went through on the right in uh, the matter of uh, five days. Another way we can, you know, that's a hard ask to have a patient collect. Uh, so we have a little pictorial chart we use, and we're happy to share that with you, where you uh, make little uh, scratches of how many uh, tampons and pads you go through each day of the week. So you can see it, uh, you know, out there in that sense. And then postpartum hemorrhage can be disastrous where the patient bleeds out and needs blood transfusions. Look at this patient, how many uh, products of blood they needed there. Those are all, uh, you know, uh, blood products there that they're going to give the patient. And in the worst situation, they have to, you know, do a hysterectomy. And then if uh, one has an orthopedic injury or uh, uh, twists their knee or is doing vigorous uh, activity, they could bleed into the joint. Look how big this uh, knee joint on the right is compared to the left. 
and that's all blood in there. And the uh, knees are a common target. Usually it's the, uh, the knees, the, uh, the uh, ankles first, because in this day and age, there's less high top sneakers and not as much uh, ankle support. So especially this time of year in the summer, kids are you know, walking around without good uh, ankle support. And uh, you know, that's a, a big issue. And then less likely the elbow and shoulders in that sense. But bleeding into the joint is something we really, really want to avoid and prevent because if we don't uh, get on top of it, that bleed here in the left, in the left knee, can then stimulate uh, the growth of tissue, synovial tissue, that is, uh, can cause pain like rheumatoid arthritis. And then in time, the blood can break down the, uh, the, the uh, joint space. See how there's no joint space here? See the joint space here where my white arrow is? See how you lose it over here? And ultimately, in the worst case scenario, it's like severe osteoarthritis where you need your uh, joint replaced at that time. And you can see this uh, patient in the work we've done through the World Federation of Hemophilia. This was in Central Asia. I had a wonderful opportunity for four years to visit the Central Asia country of Kyrgyzstan. And this is a potato farmer who spent years hauling potatoes over the left shoulder. And as he did that, he eventually kept bleeding into that left shoulder and, no, and now he can no longer raise it while he can raise the other one. And then the one on the right is very tragic. This is a young boy. What's tragic is not only that when we saw him that day, he had a bleed in his left knee, but look at this knee. Look at what is so striking with this leg compared to this leg. Well, obviously he doesn't have swelling in this leg, but I can tell you that he first kept bleeding into that right knee. Just like he bled here, he used to have a swollen right knee. He got bleeding into that joint, because once you bleed into the joint, it kind of becomes a target or a mark uh, site. And once you keep bleeding into it, that's going to weaken your leg. And then over time, your muscles uh, weaken, they atrophy. Look how, how weak his muscles are here, how shriveled those muscles are compared to the muscles here. What will happen to this thigh will, hap will happen what happened here. These muscles will atrophy and shrink. So it's very sad. And uh, thankfully, uh, if uh, one has access to factor, we can prevent that from happening. So how do we prevent that from happening? How do we prevent, those of you who are listening to this call who have a very low factor 10 level and have uh, occasionally bled into your joints, how do we prevent uh, future bleeding where your joints could uh, become quite swollen on the left, as in this case, or scarred on the, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, swollen on the right here in the case of this left knee, or scarred in the case of the picture on the left here in the left shoulder here. So the way we do that is, as we do in children who have severe factor eight or factor nine deficiency, classically called hemophilia, in the case of severe factor 10 deficiency, which we would call as a rare form of hemophilia, we can try to give factor uh, preventively, what we call prophylaxis, preventively. And uh, the way we try to do that is we try to encourage the children to go to camp this time of year, not to have just a great time, but so we can eventually teach them how to give themselves their own infusion. At first, we teach the parents. And at camp, we also have a wonderful time where we have many wonderful activities of making birdhouses there on the left or riding bikes with helmets, of course, uh, and also swimming. But our motive for camp is also not only to have a great time, but also to show the young teenagers uh, or the children, the preteens who are 10 years old and uh, older, to how to give their own factor 10 to themselves. So we start by having them uh, wash their hands. And trust me, this kid did wash his hand. He just was painting a white and yellow birdhouse earlier in the day. Uh, but he did wash his hands. And uh, as he does that, we also have him prepare the missing factor here, the factor 10, let's say, uh, and uh, take, the and take the solution. He's going to mix it. He's going to pull up some uh, saline here from the vial. So this is all saline, salt water. And then he's going to uh, dissolve the clotting factor, which is a protein, and uh, put it into solution. And then once he does that, he's then going to take his own, his uh, other hand, and he's going to have popped his vein here. He's going to pop the vessel right here with a tourniquet. And the vessel gets very big, and then he can put the needle in there 
and then he can put the needle in and then draw out the blood. Once he gets a little blood coming out here, you can see that in the next slide, he can then switch the syringe and, and pour the syringe that he had dissolved the factor 10 in. So this is factor 10 going now through the needle into his vein. And this is a great accomplishment. It uh, builds the child's self-esteem that now they can kind of uh, act for themselves. It empowers them. It also frees up the parent from doing this uh, several times a week. And uh, this is a great accomplishment. And at the camp, we award them with medals. And um, we also uh, have their mentors. The boys above them uh, also have severe hemophilia. And uh, they also uh, gave the, the children a lot of encouragement and showed them how to do it. So it's really a wonderful uh, you know, process to learn to, how to do your own infusion prophylaxis. And certainly this applies to people who have severe factor 10 deficiency. If it's not severe, we can, uh, on occasion, if you're bleeding, you could just come to the hemophilia center uh, and uh, our nurses can give you the infusion then. So it's a reminder that we don't take care of you in a vacuum. It takes all of us. It takes a family to do this. And this is my wonderful Newman Hemophilia Association uh, family where we would uh, go up there. I went there four wonderful summers in a row and they were very welcoming. They had me bring my own family and we became like family ourselves. And this is in a wonderful uh, camp camp in, uh, in, in Maine outside of Augusta, Camp Mechuana. So uh, every year, this is a wonderful time, uh, you know, for camp. And once we show them how to do their own infusions, then we can prevent bleeding, for example, with surgery. We could have them infuse an hour before they see the dentist, before they, they're going to have a uh, dental extraction. Or we can give instructions to the, surgery, to the surgeon to infuse beforehand. Or what at the time of circumcision? We could take precautions. We used to infuse fresh frozen plasma. In the old days, we had the candy striper, the volunteer, uh, thaw the plasma. But nowadays, as I mentioned, factor 10 is made as a concentrate, and we can give that um, now uh, as a purified product called Coagadex. But we have to be very careful with what we're doing because Coagadex is very expensive. So we just can't give it willy-nilly. We have to make sure we get approval for it from the insurance company. Before we had Coagadex, we had Profil 9. And I've used that before. I had a wonderful patient of mine who had severe factor 10 deficiency, and we would infuse that. Um, it's a larger volume, and it's probably not as effective because it also has the other chronic factors. So we're very excited now that we have this pure product uh, called Coagadex. And again, we would do it if they bled into, you know, the uh, hematoma. Um, and then um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, the question comes up, what would you do if someone has a very large hematoma? You need to remove it. That very large hematoma is called a pseudotumor. So going back to one of my passions of, uh, of, of doing medical missions uh, through the World Federation of Hemophilia, after the uh, four wonderful years we spent going to Kyrgyzstan, our team was selected to uh, work with colleagues in uh, also in Asia, but in Nepal. And in Nepal, we encountered this uh, a very nice patient with a factor 10 level of 2%, so a very low level. And uh, our team came and we brought a, uh, a very renowned surgeon, my colleague, uh, Professor Pierre uh, Sopameno from Milan, Italy. And uh, we also had our physiotherapist from uh, uh, Philadelphia, Angie, Angie, Dr. Angie Forsyth. And together, our team was able to pull off removal of this very, very large hematoma. It's this large collection of blood that's called a hematoma. And uh, you can see on the uh, angiogram, uh, it's like a tumor. It's not a tumor per se, it's just a collection of blood. This was so bad, he was oozing from it and he had trouble walking. So thank, uh, thankfully, through the World Federation of Hemophilia, they were able to obtain donation of factor 10 coagulant. And we gave that to them uh, every day for three days, and then we're able to give it every other day. We're able to back off. And before we did the surgery, this was Professor Solomeno checking, uh, examining it with uh, our physiotherapist, Angie uh, Forsyth, who put together the physiotherapy plan after the operation. And then this is the day of the operation, 
where we had him on his left side so we could expose the area. And then basically what Dr. Solmano and his surgical colleagues did from Nepal is they made incisions and they started putting out the uh, factor there. And you can see, uh, I mean the clot, and you can see the clot that was collecting. By the end of three hours, this is the amount of clot. We, we had several bowls of this. And at the end of surgery, you could see how he closed it up. And it was, it, it was actually an indentation where we removed all the blood, all the clot here. And uh, we were very excited that he had a good result. And uh, this is our team here. We uh, posted on Twitter that we carried out the first major excision uh, in a patient in Nepal. And uh, again, we are not like seagulls. We didn't go in there and do the uh, surgery and then leave and leave a mess. We trained these very fine surgeons from Nepal who now have uh, done few further surgeries like this and are very qualified to do it on their own. And this is a nice post-op uh, you know, uh, picture. A few more uh, 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 bleeding situations, bleeding into the brain. Uh, that would require clotting factor. Uh, bleeding into the, uh, the mouth uh, requires clotting factor. It's really bleeding out or we could use normal gloves. We kind of give clotting factor if they have uh, major bleeding that's outlined in the red boxes. And then for bleeding from the mucosal surfaces, uh, we can often use a medication to prevent breakdown of the clot called Lysata or Amicar syrup. And so that's something to think about when you're having dental work. And these are kind of the questions to ask. If it's a dental cleaning and you've not had bleeding with prior dental cleaning, nothing needs to be done. But if you're having a lot of gingivitis, we should prescribe the medication I mentioned called uh, Amicar um, in that uh, regard. And regardless of the severity of factor, like I said, we'd like to use the Amicar. We like to have some advance notice so we could order it and get approval. Because without approval, it can be very expensive. If that's not available, if it's too expensive and the insurance company won't cover it, then we could use this generic oral form, which you would begin 24 hours beforehand. And uh, the Amicar could also be given intravenously into great juice. In terms of some other bleeding issues for heavy periods, we don't need to give factor. Usually we can uh, try to use chromotherapy to uh, slow down the bleeding. Uh, if not, Lysata, that oral uh, blood clot stabilizer can work quite well. Uh, that we talked about using it orally uh, for dental work. Uh, and then obviously if the bleeding continues, you could think about using factor 10. And then for childbirth-related bleeding, uh, we typically um, you know, uh, would uh, uh, infuse factor if the level's very low, as well as use the lice data in that sense. So I hope in the last uh, 30 minutes I've been able to um, uh, give you a nice overview of uh, factor 10, how it uh, occurs. Uh, and uh, the various uh, types of severity and the bleeding uh, complications and how best to manage them. I feel that I'm always a better doctor because of you, the patients. That's why I enjoy doing these sessions. I learn as much from my patients as, I, as they do from me. So I want to thank my patients. Um, and uh, um, in case uh, one is uh, wondering about uh, the audacity of this doctor show pictures of his patients, don't worry, I got their permission, and they did sign the release. So I'm going to stop here and give you some time to fill out the session evaluation. And I thank you for your time and interest. And again, if you would like to reach me, uh, you could uh, email me. Thank you.